I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case Massachusetts versus EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is part two of my uh, lessons about this case. This is a US Supreme Court case from 2007, and this is for my administrative law class. And here we're going to be doing the part of the case that's about standing to sue federal agencies. In another video lecture, I discuss uh, the sort of legal, other legal question in the case about uh, whether agency inaction is a cognizable claim. So let's look at what happens in this case. So just to recap the facts, a group of states through their uh, each state's attorney general sued to compel the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate carbon dioxide emissions from cars as air pollution under the Clean Air Act, which the EPA at the time had not been doing. And so this part, part of the case relates to standing and whether the states have standing to sue the agency over this. And as I mentioned, the other part is about suing for agency inaction. In other words, the agency was simply refusing to regulate greenhouse gases. And so that's in a separate video. And to sort of cut to the chase here for the holding, a majority, and it's a slim majority, five to four, held that the plaintiffs actually did have standing to challenge the EPA's denial of their rulemaking petition. And so this became actually a pretty important case for the development of the doctrine about standing in our legal system. And to sort of summarize the classic expression about standing or to review for you before we proceed, when we talk about standing, normally a party must show it has suffered a concrete and particularized injury that is either actual or imminent, that the injury is fairly traceable to the defendant and that a favorable decision will likely redress that injury. And that should sound familiar or remind you of the holding in the Lujan case. Now, here, one step that the court does that's very significant for understanding the doctrine of standing is they find a statutory modification to standing doctrine, and that is that Congress has created basically a cause of action by statute. And so Congress has created a procedural right to protect a party's concrete interests, including under the Administrative Procedure Act, the right to challenge an agency action unlawfully withheld. And so where we have a statute like that, plaintiffs can sue without meeting all the normal standards for redressability and immediacy. So if you think about it uh, for a moment, um, even though it, the injury is supposed to be immediate, the, um, if the agency hasn't done anything at all, you're probably going to be alleging that you, the harm is going to eventuate, is going to come in the future. That's a little different than where the agency is currently harming you and you want the court to make them stop. So when you're complaining about the party's inaction uh, and you have a statutory right to challenge this lack of action, then immediacy is going to be problematic. So we're going to redress that kind of prong of this, the standing rule. And the same with redressability. It's a little different if you're asking the court to order um, a government agent to stop what they're doing, as opposed to asking them to um, order the agency to do something that they've been neglecting. So let's proceed. Now, let's talk about the EPA's argument here. Um, they said that the plaintiffs in this case, like Massachusetts and other states, lacked standing to sue. And they sort of had three arguments. First, they said that the alleged injury, which is basically global warming, affects the, the whole globe, right? The whole world and not just Massachusetts or any of these individual plaintiffs. So therefore they're saying the injury is not particularized here. You can't sue for something that affects everybody equally. So in theory, that's their argument. Um, secondly, they said that um, the harm from global warming is going to take decades to unfold, right? So if sea levels are rising um, a few inches a year or something like that, before we really have um, a loss of coastline, it's going to take years, maybe decades before we really have a catastrophe, that at least at the time the EPA is arguing this. And Third, they, um, and this becomes the most important for this case, they said that the relief that the states wanted, which was more regulations, would actually not provide any true redress for the injury 
And so let's develop that point a little bit. The EPA argued that their decisions about regulating or not regulating greenhouse gas emissions from cars would have a trivial impact on the petitioner's injuries. And that the relief, so that relief sought, um, the new regulations would not realistically mitigate global climate change or remedy the harms to the plaintiffs. In fact, the EPA argued, even if they we banned all automobiles, in um, the United States that we would still have carbon emissions increasing from China and India and other countries that would offset any marginal domestic decrease in emissions that would result from the proposed regulations um, at issue in this case. And so they're basically saying, it's nice that you want us to do something to solve, uh, to stop climate change, um, or, but the fact is nothing we can do is going to make any difference. So um, the, now the holding in the case, again, the majority holds that the EPA's refusal to regulate greenhouse gas emissions presented a risk of harm to Massachusetts that was both actual and at least sufficiently imminent. Although I mentioned earlier that they're relaxing the imminence requirement a little bit. Um, in addition, they said it was likely that the judicial relief requested would prompt the EPA to take steps to reduce that risk, that is, to regulate. In other words, there's no question that the Supreme Court can compel or order the EPA to, um, uh, to carry out their statutory mandate and promulgate some regulations to stop air pollution. And, um, and so since that would at least reduce uh, statistically the risk, even if it doesn't solve the whole problem, the court can do that. And this brings us to another part of the case that was development uh, important for the development of the doctrine of standing, which is this idea of special solicitude for states. So the court makes a big deal out of the fact that Massachusetts is a sovereign state, not a private individual, which means the standing analysis is a little bit different. As a state, Massachusetts actually has a long coastline because um, of Cape Cod that curls out into the ocean and sort of a swirl. Um, and the state actually owns a lot of the property along its coastline. Um, and But when states joined the union, they yielded or ceded a lot of their rights, uh, sort of sovereign state rights, uh, to the federal government. And one of those is uh, the ability to regulate things like air pollution themselves. In other words, Congress has regulated air pollution and the Clean Air Act preempts Massachusetts. So Massachusetts can't make their own um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions rules because they're preempted by federal law, nor can a state negotiate pollution treaties with other countries. So you can't have Massachusetts go sign the Kyoto Protocols. Um, and nor can they um, do anything really if other states are putting out a lot of pollution, let's say the Midwest states, and then that pollution, once it's in the atmosphere, migrates over to New England and um, affects uh, uh, Massachusetts. And so, right, we can't have, we don't get to have Massachusetts going to war with Ohio over the air pollution. And so by joining the union, they gave up a lot of rights. And so that means that we need to give them, the, the court says, some sort of special considerations when they're seeking redress from the federal government. The majority also emphasizes that the scientific consensus, uh, that there is a scientific consensus that climate change is already causing sea levels to rise. So the harm is already visible and will eventually cause enormous damage to ecosystems, the spread of disease and more severe weather related disasters. And it's interesting to note that the EPA at the time in the early 2000s did not dispute a causal connection between man-made emissions and global warming. Uh, they thought that there was room to argue about how long this will take and uh, when it will be severe and so forth, but they were not um, taking the position that climate change is a hoax or something like that, that you hear people say today. Um, they recognize that there is uh, global warming happening and that it is uh, man uh, caused by man-made activities and man-made emissions, their core argument here is that um, nothing that they can do is going to make a difference. And the court pushes back on that and says, look, uh, regulating car emissions might not in itself solve the whole problem. It might not reverse global warming. But it, that doesn't mean that the court 
lacks jurisdiction to hear this case or decide whether the EPA still has a duty to take steps to slow this process of global warming or, or maybe reduce the, the impact of it. And so um, it's hard to argue that a reduction in domestic uh, emissions um, wouldn't slow the pace of global emissions increases no matter what happens elsewhere, right? So we don't, you don't have to, we, you're not denied judicial redress and standing just because you're asking for a remedy that's incomplete, right? Um, it, it could help. And maybe there will be other factors, other uh, policy aspects that will also, uh, in conjunction with this, make a difference. I pulled out a quote that helps capture um, the, sort of the core of the court majority's opinion here. Uh, Congress has moreover recognized a concomitant procedural right to challenge the rejection of its rulemaking petition as arbitrary and capricious. So that's the argument about the APA that I referred to earlier. Given that procedural right and Massachusetts's stake in protecting its quasi-government interest, sovereign interests, the Commonwealth is entitled to special solicitude in our standing analysis. In other words, we're going to sort of relax the standing rules for a state. Now, Justice Roberts wrote a dissent on the issue of standing. Justice Scalia also wrote a dissent, but it's on the other issue of the case about whether um, under the statute, the EPA had a duty to act and um, so that meant you could challenge the agency's inaction. So uh, Justice Roberts writes the dissent on standing. And what he does is he mostly echoed the EPA's redressability argument that any regulations it might promulgate would not make much difference in mitigating global warming. Um, here's a quote from his dissent. As is often the case, the questions of causation and redressability overlap. And so you may remember that under kind of classic standing doctrine, we have, we require three prongs, injury in fact, causation between the defendant's conduct and the injury, and then um, the availability of judicial redress that the courts actually could do something about it. And he admits here that in practice, a lot of times, causation and redress sort of collapse into one consideration. In other words, you can't really talk about causation without talking about redress and vice versa. And he's, so he's saying, look, even though maybe um, the car emissions are causing the harm, but the EPA's inaction, um, even if we made the EPA do the opposite, it's not going to really affect, make it, it's gonna make a de minimis effect on the overall impact of the injury. And so in that sense, when we start talking about redressability, we end up collapsing it into our discussion of causation. And that concludes our discussion about the standing um, issue in Massachusetts versus EPA. In some of our uh, administrative law casebooks, they actually break the case up and have the part of the case that's about challenging agency inaction in a different section of the casebook and this part of the case in the section with the other cases about standing.